The deadly operatives of the Officio Assassinorum just got far scarier with the release of the Imperial Agents Codex, so let's take a focused look at these deadly agents and the carnage and utility that they can bring in game. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking assassins, and in this video I thought we'd do an overview of how they're looking in the Imperial Agents Codex. We'll talk about their general rules and stats, and going over each data sheet in turn, and roughly what they bring to the table. The Officio Assassinorum is an interesting, secretive, and deadly organisation in Warhammer 40k, a clandestine branch of the Administratum, organised into great temples to train human assassins into pinnacles of their craft, utterly mastering death in one form. To command and dismatch these agents is a great tool of political power within the Imperium, and their use is only sanctioned by the highest of ranks. Operatives dispatched when a single death is needed to send a message or tip the tide of a war, perhaps taking down a rogue planetary governor that hadn't been playing their tithes, or was harbouring rebellious thoughts, or the long-range assassination of an enemy tyrant, commander, or warlord to hold a Chaos or Xenos invasion in its tracks. The most well-known branches of the assassins are the ones that they have models for. The Vindicare assassins are supreme snipers. The Collector assassins are anti psycho nor pariah horrors. Soulless abominations much feared by the Eldari. The Calidus assassins can shapeshift with their polymorphine, often working for months or years to integrate themselves within their targets in a circle before dispatching their foe. And Eversaw assassins are drug-crazed killers turned into a biological living weapon with friends on, and capable of butchering an entire command structure of traitors, hopefully taking their primary targets down with them. They're miniature are quite fun, black clad individuals, each one having a lot of character, there's also that alternative sculpt for the Vindicare, which was the Warhammer Plus diorama miniature, and the fairly standard character prices from Games Workshop. If you're looking to pick them up, there's discount links down in the video description that help to support the channel. I feel like with their allied nature, you often see kit bashes for assassins, say converting a super guard sniper to stand in for a Vindicare, or murderous space marine melee specialist to take the place of an Eversaw, for example. Codex Imperial Agents changed quite a lot of things for Imperial allies, though broadly the assassins are pretty similar. As before, you can ally in one character unit to an incursion level force, so usually around a thousand points. Or for a 2000 point strike force game you can have two allied characters, so basically any imperial force could field up to two assassins if they wanted. And while their fortunes over the years have waxed and waned, 10th edition has been a relatively good time for them, often being fielded in competitive lists, some more so than others. Pre-codex and all the updates, the Calidus was easily the most commonly played one. Her polymorphine allows you to jump on and off the board doing secondaries, which is particularly good for actions in the Pariah Nexus missions. That tends to be the main attraction for her, although she does do other good stuff with the command point things, and does genuinely have a bit of dangerous damage that can hit a lot of medium infantry. A bunch of armies just don't have enormously good units for bouncing around doing actions, and she can do it all game long if desired, and could be worth a fair few victory points if she can continue doing that while staying safe. Otherwise, out of the rest, the Eversaw and Vindicare maybe saw a bit more niche play. No operatives are just disruptive and generally helpful to have for screening out things. The Eversaw can scout forward fast, I was fairly fighty against medium or lighter infantry, and the Vindicare can easily contribute to the battle and make enemy leaders duck and cover, all while staying kind of safe compared with the rest of them. Imperial Knights were perhaps a particularly common user of assassins, really really a bad choice for any army, but particularly having a force where you don't really have any subtle infantry units, it's maybe not too surprising they're more popular there than elsewhere. That was all before, it's going to be interesting to see how people adapt with the new buffs that they've got, as things did change quite a bit in Codex Imperial Agents. For their base profile, the assassins are fairly similar. Most of them move 7 inches besides the Eversaw. They've got Toughness 4, a 4 plus invulnerable save, 4 wounds, Leadership 6, and Objective Control 1, so they're not exactly going to be much threat to contesting primary points, but they can do actions and things. They're all lone operatives, so you can't shoot them outside of 12 inches, besides other Vindicares, interestingly enough now. And in general, they are going to need to rely on either hiding behind terrain or using that lone operative rule to survive. Only 4 wounds at toughness 4 means that any one serious anti-tank shot or barrage of small arms could easily knock them out. Perhaps as you'd expect, you do need to play carefully with them and make sure they don't get killed too easily before they've achieved their goals. All of them are epic heroes, so you can't take any more than one of each, and they can't be given enhancements or anything in the Imperial Agents Codex. And all of them also come with a special deployment rule of some sort, either Deep Strike, Infiltrators, or Scouts. 
One of the biggest changes that happened with the Codex was the Shadow Assignment rule. This one's a remaking of an old ability where you can basically swap out any assassin for any other at the deploy army step of the game. So basically after you've seen your opponent's army and you've decided exactly which operative will be best for the job. It certainly does seem like a pretty interesting option, maybe most relevant for the Collectors more than the rest, given that that one's kind of specific to certain matchups with its actual damage dealing, being far far better against Psychers, even if it does do some other more interesting stuff now. Otherwise, I guess if the opponent's relying on loads of lone operatives or good support characters, perhaps a Vindicare could be just a bit more useful than otherwise. I think that the idea is interesting. It means that if you take an assassin, you could basically have a bit of a sideboard and choose something to counter the opponent, which could be kind of spooky. I guess on the downside, if you did want to make maximal use of this, you'd need to have all the models ready to go, unless you're doing a bit of proxying. So maybe it's partly Games Workshop trying to push a bit of model sales on the side as well. I guess we won't know the full utility of this until we find out their final points costs. They'll be coming in the Munitorium Field Manual in the not too distant future. Let's talk through the actual assassins now, and we'll start off with the Sniper Supreme that is the Vindicare. He's got the standard assassin stat line, and for bonus special rules he gets both Infiltrators and Stealth. It does mean that you could have him infiltrate into the mid board if you want to, though given his role I wouldn't really want to push him too far up. Maybe it could be an interesting option for putting down a bit outside of the deployment zone on a flank where the enemy hasn't really put much, somewhere where they're not just going to be able to march up to him and destroy him. I guess you could also use the battlefield's height as well, depending on what's available. You could put him up in a very high ruin in the midboard if you think that that could keep him safe, maybe with the advantage of some slightly better lines of sight. Obviously his main thing is all about the range damage, he does get a little bit of melee damage with a Vindicare combat knife, but it's not going to be doing much against anything but light infantry. Obviously the big deal is his sniper damage, he attacks with his Exodus rifle that got a nasty buff in the Agent's Codex. You get a single shot hitting on a 2, strength 8, AP 3 and damage D3 plus 3. The strength 8 means that it's wounding standard marines on a 2 plus now. Of course it's precision, it gets to ignore cover, has the heavy keyword which could ward off against certain modifiers if he's static, and also gets devastating wounds as well if you happen to roll a 6. His shield break around got even nastier as well. Once per game you get a single super powered shot with plus one to wound and every successful wound roll is a critical wound. So basically that'll mean that it's a devastating wound and they punch straight through invulnerable saves and saving throws and things. The only thing that would ward off the damage there would be feel no pains or things that save against mortal wounds. It's definitely a threat that enemy characters can't take too lightly. With average rolling, he's around about 40% likely to get a successful wound converted against a 4 plus invulnerable save toughness 4 character, which is enough to be scary, but I'd say not enough to be reliable. It's far better if he's using the shield break around, of course, when he just needs a 2 plus to hit and a 2 plus to wound that adds up to be about a 70% chance, and could be a particularly juicy target to use a command point reroll on if he does happen to fail the wound roll or something. Overall, whether or not he's using Shield Breaker, there's a pretty reasonable chance of converting that D3 plus 3 damage, which could be enough to one-shot plenty of support characters out there. Otherwise, he's got a fairly strong backup pistol, 3 shots with the Exodus pistol at strength 6, AP 2, damage 3. Against Elite Infantry that gets close, it will be stronger, though it does mean that he's going to be within retaliation range if he's within 12 inches. And then finally, the other massive boost that he got in the Codex is the ability to shoot lone operatives even greater than 12 inches away. This one's a pretty crazy ability that nothing in the game really has at the moment. I guess it maybe makes sense for Vindicare Sniper Supreme to have it, if anyone. But basically means he counters lone operatives in quite a painful way. They often want to be standing out in the open, relying on their shooting protection to keep them safe and screening out areas of the board and stuff. Him just being able to ping them at long range is pretty massive in stopping them doing what they want to do. Overall, between all that, it's certainly terrifying and really quite disruptive. Perhaps the biggest weakness, though, is just not having enormously great targets, or the enemy just managing to play fairly cagey and not let their important character units just get shot by him. They might be able to hide their characters fairly convincingly for a turn or two, and even when they are exposed, their demise isn't exactly guaranteed, particularly if they're, say, big chunky 5 or 6 wound characters. With all he's got, though, he certainly looks like a really scary threat. Next up, we've got the Collectors Assassin, the Anti-Psychic Horror. He's got a similar sort of stat line to the Vindicare, but gets a 2 plus feel no pain against psychic attacks. They're not everywhere, but that means that they won't do very much to him. He doesn't get Infiltrate, but can instead Deep Strike, and that Deep Strike is incredibly powerful. 
His etheric immersion special rule means that he can set up anywhere that's greater than 3 inches away from enemy models, and as normal for those rules, can't charge. A 3 inch deep strike is a pretty massively powerful ability. Things like Inceptors were often near auto include for Space Marines, just being able to drop in, do secondary objectives for guaranteed, and putting a little bit of pinpoint damage output somewhere. I don't feel like that would have changed all that much in Pariah Nexus, where actions are a big deal and secondary objectives maybe aren't as easy to achieve as they were before. You could also use it to actually deal damage, potentially getting line of sights to a key psycho with the Anima Speculum. It's got the grenades keyword as well, so you could double down on that and a bunch of mortal wounds if you have a command point spare, or potentially you could think about rapid ingressing him if you wanted, maybe have him drop somewhere problematic and kind of close to the enemy where they're not going to be able to destroy him this turn, and then in your turn he can move up and actually properly deal damage with shooting and charging. Lots of scary options with 3 inch deep strikers, even if it is on a fairly fragile model without that much shooting. Talking of damage dealing though, he is very much an anti psycho specialist, really very strong against them, but not super scary against other things, even if he will do a bit of okay damage to medium infantry like Space Marines. The Anima Speculum gets 3 shots to 24 inches, Strength 5, AP-2 and Damage D3, it gets the Assault keyword so you can advance and use it, of course it's Precision because he's an Assassin, and then against Psycho models you wound on a 2+, and also he has a bonus special rule that increases the attacks of that weapon to 6. Between all that, if he's targeting a Psyker with a 3 plus armor save or a 5 plus invulnerable save, you average around about something like 5 to 6 wounds against them, so a pretty good chance to kill something like, say, a Space Marine Librarian in the open. Otherwise, in melee, he has his life draining touch, 4 attacks at strength 4, AP 2, and damage 2, which to be honest, for an individual lone operative character that's fairly fragile isn't all that much. Again though, it is absolutely great against Psychers. anti psyker 2 plus and devastating wounds means that every 2 plus that you roll to wound will be essentially 2 mortal wounds against that Psyker. Again that averages out to be around about 5 to 6 mortal wounds against those targets, so it could be an instant dead Psyker there. If he is able to get this drop on an enemy witch via deep strike or rapid ingress or anything, it's going to make his presence felt. Finally, the last improvement of the datasheet I think also made him a bit more interesting. His Battleshock debuff rule was changed to a once per game, forcing everyone to test Battleshock within 9 inches. The enemy units affected have to do that at minus 1 to the test, or minus 2 to the test if the enemy is a Psyker. The fact that it triggers in the command phase is really big, as it means that you can do it just before the enemy scores. So if you had that in range of an objective that they had, that could be a pretty direct way to reduce some victory points if they get unlucky. With a minus 1 to test, that would be around about a 40% chance to fail for a leadership 6 unit, or around a 60% chance to fail for leadership 7. Potentially if he did drop in with that 3 inch deep strike to do a secondary objective, and could also be in place to put that down, say on some low leadership objective grabbers holding the backfield, he could score some victory points for you in your turn, and have a good chance to deny the opponent some big primary points in theirs. Between those two rules, he's certainly got far more interesting for scoring, never mind his actual dealing with Psyker's rules. Next up, we've got the frenzied murder killer that is the Eversaw. He moves a bit faster than the rest of them, moving 9 inches, and also gets a 9 inch scout move as well. So potentially that could be 18 inches towards the enemy turn 1 if you wanted, and then charge. Definitely not impossible to be doing a deployment zone to a deployment zone charge, and even more so with his special rules. He also gets the grenade keyword as well if he needs a little bit more focused damage. I do quite like the way that he gets Deadly Demise D3 as the way to represent his bio meltdown. It's only going to trigger quite rarely, but kind of funny to have the assassin basically explode all over the enemy once in a while if they take him down. He gets a small amount of shooting at range with his Executioner pistol. It's only 4 shots at strength 4, AP 0, damage 1, but he can advance and shoot it. It's anti-infantry 3+, plus, and now he has both precision and sustained hits on it all the time. On average, you get something like 5 or 6 hits, though it will be very swingy depending on whether you roll a 6 or not. His main purpose in life, though, is to kill things very hard in close combat, and between his melee profile and his special rules, he can certainly get there and do that quite well. Compared with Pre-Codex, he has all three of the friends on buffs rolled into one, so he always gets precision, always gets sustained hits 3 on his melee attacks, and his normal profile is 6 attacks at strength 5, AP 2, damage 2. From an average round of combat, you'd expect around about 5 slain termagants, maybe 3 or 4 dead space marines, or 1 or 2 terminators. Certainly a good chunk taken out of a squad, and with damage 2 on those attacks, 
if he hits a leader unit, there is a good chance that he could kill his target in a round of combat. For his special rules though, he gets to advance and charge, so it's typically going to be going 9 plus 3d6 inches in terms of his charge threat range. He could easily be hiding behind a ruin in your zone and then jump all the way into the midfield. And just in case that wasn't enough, he also has a special rule called overkill. Once per game, instead of advancing, you add plus 6 inches to his normal move. So that's to be a 15 inch move and then charge. And then in that turn, you also add a plus three attacks to his melee weapons. So that's nine attacks with that power sword and neuro gauntlet. On the turn that matters, that's an even more crazy threat range and even more damage output, killing around about eight termagants, five normal space marines or two terminators on average. Obviously, as with the rest of them, it's going to be interesting to see his final points cost. But that's a pretty massive amount of utility. He feels a bit more like the Harlequin Solitaire model now getting a terrifying turn of absolutely enormous movement and scary blender melee. Finally for the sneaky operatives we have the Calidus Assassin, a bit of a staple of the tournament scene since 10th edition started. She gets both deep strike and infiltrators so has more setup options than the rest. Most people usually tend to start her on the board somewhere though, they're likely somewhere safe so she can go up into deep strike each turn. The previous ability was called Polymorphine but now it's called Acrobatic Escape. And it triggers at the end of the enemy fight phase, provided she's not within 3 inches of any enemy model, she can get removed from the board and then come back essentially as if from reserves, deep striking anywhere 9 inches away from the foe. And she could use that to get to unusual or problematic places on the board, or potentially go down to do things like behind enemy lines, actions on the board edges or other secondaries. If you've got an army that's otherwise maybe a bit ground bound and doesn't have that kind of mobility or deep strike units to jump all over the table, then she's pretty excellent for that and can keep on doing that all the way into the late game too. The rule even got an improvement compared with pre-codex and now she can actually fall back from enemies if she happens to be in a combat that she survived. She can fall back d6 inches which could just be good for taking the fight to the enemy again but if she does manage to get over 3 inches away from them then she could go back into the sky and that wouldn't be an option that she would have had before. For her damage output she's armed with a katan phase sword and neural shredder. The Neural Shredder is an anti-infantry 2 plus torrent weapon with AP minus 2. You average around about 2 wounds to an infantry unit with a 3 plus save. A bit of damage but not loads. In melee she gets to fight first and she does so with her face sword and poison blades. 5 attacks at strength 5, AP 4 and damage 2. A nice high AP there and she also has lethal hits and precision. In close combat her average damage output is something like 3 slain space marine intercessors which are pretty well her ideal target or around about 3 wounds to a toughness 4 character with a 4 plus invulnerable save. She's certainly nowhere near as destructive as the Eversaw for just killing a character dead out of the middle of a unit, but if she does both get to fire with the Neural Shredder and then go in with the Phase Sword and Poison Blade, there's a pretty reasonable chance that she one-shots a 4 or 5 wound Space Marine type character. Finally, she's got her Stratagem Debuff rule called Lord of Deceit. This was the one that was updated in the balanced data slate to replace her sort of ruinous stratagem type debuff. It now works with a plus one to the cost of stratagems for enemy units that use them within 12 inches. And that can be potentially seriously annoying if your opponent's trying to budget for a key stratagem, draining enemy resources or maybe just making certain stratagems not really usable. I say compared with certain models in 40k it's maybe not as easy to use on the Calidus compared with other stuff. In general, most of the time she's going to want to be making herself scarce and keeping out of trouble where possible to jump about doing secondaries. But if you don't necessarily need her to return to reserves for a turn, you could maybe be a little bit braver with the positioning. Maybe try and get that aura off on a mid-board objective where you know your opponent's going to move with a big important unit and might likely be trying to use stratagems of one sort or another on them. I feel like there's plenty of big brain plays that you could potentially do, having her drop down near to a unit that you knew your opponent would be keying up a cool stratagem for. If the opponent's only got one command point, it could outright prevent things like them using stratagems like Overwatch or any other tricky reactive stratagem as in your turn. Overall, it's definitely an interesting rule, just maybe one that needs to be known when to use it and when not to bother and just keep the assassin safe. Maybe quite a big judgement call that if you just try and do something a little bit too clever and put her up to use that ability, and then she gets killed or can't return to reserves because of it, and you lose victory points that way, it might not have turned out to be quite so clever. Overall, I do feel like with the Imperial Agents, it's been fairly exciting times for the assassins, Obviously how strong they are will depend on their final points cost, which I'll look forward to going over when the Munitorum Field Manual updates for the agents should likely be in a little bit over a week at time of recording. 
The codex printed points values were 125 points for everything but the Vindicare, who was 105, which is kind of interesting given that he is probably one of the most interesting ones now. However, in 10th edition, codex points are very much not final points, and we'll have to see what the field manual has in store for them. I would expect points rises compared with what they were previously though. All of them got better, maybe the Calidus got the smallest buff out of them, though was arguably the strongest before, but the rest got some seriously interesting rules and abilities, or just raw danger like the Eversaw. I still say out of them, probably the Calexus might be the most niche if they were at the same sort of points cost. The 3 inch deep strike and the objective stuff is pretty great though. Maybe it could be an interesting option to flex to if you've got Psychers in the enemy ranks. The Eversource sheer threat range and damage dealing I think is really interesting on a lone operative. Certainly feels pretty equivalent to the Harlequin Solitaire and I wouldn't be too surprised to see him see a bit of play like that. The Vindicare can off enemy commanders a bit more reliably and being a sort of counter tech piece to lone operatives is a really big deal. It feels like the Calidus still looks pretty excellent for objectives, bouncing around the table, doing actions and racking up the points and then maybe committing to the fight in the late game, taking out some key units if it makes sense to. I did have a look through the actual agents codex for their detachments, it looks like the only one that really buffs them in a big way is the Imperialist fleet one. And that can give them a couple of interesting things. You could get an infiltrating Eversaur assassin with an enhancement if you wanted to. I sort of feel like his vast movement means that he can get where he wants to go anyway. And you could get Lance Melee on him if you're attacking something on an objective. I guess that's quite a big deal with a whole flurry of strength 5 damage 2 attacks. In general though, I feel like they'll be useful for agents, but maybe not enormously any more so than you would for other detachments out there. In any case, let me know your thoughts on the new assassins. Would you be tempted to put any of them on the table? And how far do you think those points will rise? If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well. And you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep all the content coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.